for your salvation and you're going to continue to repent. You just continually walk before the Lord in that kind of humility. And so we confess him as our Lord and our Savior, but we turn to him daily as our Savior. So think about that and think about those times where you, you, you felt like the Lord was there with you and, and everything was working out and you felt confident in your faith. Just remember that the Lord is faithful to complete that work. And I want to encourage you as we look now at 1 Peter to know that we have this living hope. It is alive. It's different. It's not like the hope that the world has. Our hope is different. And we have a person in whom we can trust. Amen? The Lord Jesus Christ. So we'll begin here. The letter of 1 Peter. Notice there, verse 1. Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace be multiplied. Now, many of the New Testament letters are known or referred to more by, way, by the recipient, by whom this letter has been written to, right? We think of like the book of Romans or Corinthians. To that church, there was a letter written. But there's a few letters in the New Testament which we refer to more based on the author. And that's what we have here. We have 1 Peter, one of the two letters that Peter wrote. So... What is it that we know about Peter? I like to start there because today as we kick off this book, we need kind of an introduction to it. You think about Peter the Apostle. Notice as he says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Who is Peter? And for many of us, and I could just take some time this morning, we won't do it, but you say, who is Peter to you? What do you remember about his life? Let me see if I can summarize it. Well, he's one of the 12, one of the first original 12 apostles of Jesus Christ. But he's also one of the three, one of the three who intimately was able to spend time with Jesus and be a part of certain experiences that the others missed out on. But he even seems to be kind of maybe that older, more bold uh, disciple that Jesus called upon. He was the one who was seasoned in life. And then Jesus showed up and interrupted his career, if you will. He was a leader. We see that stands out to us in the narratives, the gospels of Jesus. We know that he was an experienced fisherman. That was his trade. He was the brother of Andrew. And it was originally Andrew who went to Peter, remember, and said, hey, look, we found the Christ. We know that his original name was Simon. Later he was called Peter by Jesus. Jesus referred to him, now you have a new calling the rock. Jesus had plans for Peter. Now, although a leader, although maybe a seasoned person in life, Peter had a lot to learn. Peter wasn't perfect, was he? He he made a lot of mistakes. We know that Peter was hasty, especially with words. It seems that he had the the foot and mouth syndrome. If you know what that's like, where you go, why did I say that? I wish I would have just kept quiet, you know. Peter was that guy. He sometimes would speak too quickly, and at times he would boldly profess good things as well. So, Peter was the first pope. No, I'm kidding. Sorry, I don't know how that got in my notes. Um, Not true, by the way. He did minister in Rome, we believe. We'll talk about that. Um, We also learned from Peter that he made mistakes, and as much as he didn't want to make those mistakes, as he, he may have had a good heart, right? He, he, he was a, the, the person who had good intentions, but he made mistakes. He just would fall short. But we also learn of Peter that the Lord, he restored him, right? And that's how we closed out our last studies. We looked at the Gospel of John, and, and we looked at the restoration of Peter. The Lord had plans for him, you know, and he wanted to make sure that he felt just as called as he was that day when Jesus came to him, when he was cleansing his nets and mending the nets. 
I still love you, Peter. I still have a plan for you. You know, there's hope for us. If you come in here today dragging your feet and you go, I don't know, I had a good start, but I don't know how about today. Well, you know what? The Lord has plans for you and he's faithful. And he's the one who called you. So just remember that. You have to put your trust again and again and again in him, the one who has called us. We also know about Peter that, as I said, you know, Jesus called him uh, Peter. You know, his name was Simon. But see, the Lord had a plan for him. And he said, you remember that day when Peter professed that he was the Christ? He said, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. Now, a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of debate around which rock was Jesus referring? Was he talking about the, the, the doctrine of Jesus being the foundations? We, we've learned, you know, he's that cornerstone. Was, was he referring to the statement that Jesus is the Messiah? Was he looking at Peter maybe? You know, was he, was he speaking or was he talking about the rock? of the location of where he was, and, and there was a place in Caesarea Philippi that could have been. You know, either way, certainly, Peter was very instrumental in the early days of the establishment of the church, wasn't he? It was Peter who stood up in Acts chapter 2 and began to preach the gospel. And certainly, in many ways, Peter spearheaded the movement. He led the way. And so in many ways, we can remember that about Peter too, that he was a leader. He was called. He was the one who was restored. And as we'll look at his letter and we learn from his words, these are lessons he had to learn, you know, and it was definitely uh, a journey. You know, these were seasons that weren't always as smooth as I'm sure he had hoped. But these are lessons that you and I can learn, and there's just going to be some profound doctrine in there as well. But notice that he says he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. You see, no one uh, would in their right mind of the day debate or contradict Peter as being one of the apostles of Jesus. You notice when you look at the letters of Paul, that he often will say, by the will of God, born out of due time, you know, also an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it was a little bit different because he wasn't one of the original 12, was he? You see, it was different for Peter. Peter did life with Jesus. And he had a lot of those uh, intimate uh, lessons that he was able to learn with Jesus right beside him. He got to walk with where Jesus walked. He got to go where Jesus went, right? He got to hear Jesus speak and teach and and, and explain these mysteries of God and simplicity. That was Peter, you know, and he, that's one of those original apostles. And so notice when he talks about being an apostle, he, there was no doubt that Peter was an apostle of Jesus Christ. And you think about what kind of statement that is. Even today, uh, just a couple of ideas, perhaps uh, some of you can relate with that. Maybe we have some some uh, certified and trained engineers. Maybe uh, you, 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 I don't know where you've got your certification, but just think about it when you hold that certificate and say, well, I, I got this at FIT. Well, that, that, that comes with a reputation. Maybe it's the MIT. And you go, oh, so you studied up there. And so people won't doubt, well, you know your stuff, right? They say, well, you, you must be a qualified engineer. Or you think of medical students in kind of the same way. You'd say, imagine if somebody showed up and said, well, I've got my MD, but I studied in Bangladesh. They may have wonderful schools there, but nobody knows. And so they kind of question it, like, I don't, I don't know. Uh, can you do this testing? We need to verify these things. But if you showed up and said, well, you, you studied at John Hopkins University or, or Harvard, it would be different. They'd say, oh, okay, we respect that. Because it comes with that reputation. In the same way, Peter's saying, look, I'm an apostle by the will and by Jesus Christ. This is who I am, an apostle of Jesus Christ. You know that. I want you to know that Jesus called me. He has a plan for me. And I want to share with you the things that I learned. So notice that as we kick this off uh, in the story, the backdrop, the introduction of this letter, that Peter was a man who was seasoned, but it wasn't always an easy journey. He was one who had to continually trust in the Lord and not lean on his own understanding. And he would certainly be one who understood that it was not about his own strength. Jesus chose him. He didn't choose Jesus first. Jesus chose him as he has us. Remember that. Who chose you? Jesus chose you first. So, Peter had the stamp of approval to say the least. Now, to whom is he writing? 
it tells us he was writing to pilgrims or strangers, or maybe your translation says foreigners. You might even just think of it as temporary residents. You know, who wants to be a nomad? You know, that's not an easy life. He's writing here now to these aliens, foreigners, pilgrims, those who, of the dispersion, and then he lists out here these five different cities and regions of the day. Now, it may not mean much to us, and as it's listed there, uh, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, these are not, um, you know, cities you can go and visit today, and they're not known of, uh, of, under these city names. However, you could go to this place, and it's not the Asia that you and, my, and I might think of. We're thinking, this is speaking of a first century Asia, Asia Minor. This is in modern day Turkey. And can you imagine that back, way back in the times of the apostles, modern day Turkey was a place that had, was filled with Christians. And if you go there today, guess what? It's hard to find Christians. I can't remember the, the, the percent now, but it's, it's something like less than 1%. And there are millions of people in Turkey. Less than 1% Christian now. I had the privilege uh, of going to eastern Turkey once. And just before going on our, our mission trip, we were going not to evangelize, but uh, to just do prayer walks and to, to meet some people. And so uh, it was a risk, but we took some New Testaments with us. And so in case we were asked, we could maybe distribute those New Testaments, but only if we were asked. And so we get there and we, we begin to uh, uh, pray over the city. and We're doing prayer walks. And it turns out that the one uh, professing Christian of that city was a Catholic priest. And he had led a school. Um, he had just been murdered, you know, and it's like, wow. Okay, so this is real. So we need to be careful walking around here. I mean, literally, it was not a safe thing uh, to be professing your faith in Christ in that particular city in Eastern Turkey. And even today, it's just, you, it's hard to fathom, but back in those days, there were churches. You can visit, perhaps some of you have done maybe those uh, missionary journeys of Paul, and you've gotten to go to some of the old cities of Modern day Turkey, you just get to go and, and maybe you take one of those cruises and you go to these old cities and you see these old churches. They're old, falling apart. They're just archaeological sites now. You can go there and look at what once was. And now it's Muslim. And, and there's just this great tension. And, and those who are Christian are not uh, boldly Christian. You go to maybe some of the big cities of Istanbul and there, there are these smaller churches. And, and even there it's dangerous. And so you just think about it here. He's writing to the pilgrims, the aliens, those who are feeling like temporary residents it, from the dispersion throughout these different cities and regions. This is whom he's writing to. These are believers. He's writing and reaching out to the believers. Notice what he says. The elect, although exiled, you're elect, chosen. By, what does he say? According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't want to go into this in much detail, but you think about the foreknowledge of God. Now, we could spend the whole morning in talking about that. You know, and, and, and I don't know where you're at in your theological position, um, but some might would think of it, now these are some fancy words and in, in, uh, kind of we might call Christianese, but regeneration, the work of the Spirit of God before faith, that God does that work in you before you believe. Now, I'll be honest and I'll just be uh, open with you, trusting you, uh, you know, with my position, but I, I don't really see that regeneration takes place before faith, but I do believe and as Peter would say here, in the foreknowledge of God, that he knows all things. He knows the end from the beginning. And in that sense, certainly the whole picture is before God in heaven, and it always has been. And so that's hard for the world to imagine or to, uh, to accept because they say, well, look at all the evil. Look at all the, 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 just the tragedy and, and all the suffering. 
And, and certainly God knows those things, but that doesn't mean that he's an author of those things. It doesn't mean that God's the one who initiated those things and, and is even a, a, a fan of suffering. You know, he's not necessarily in support of that, but he definitely knows that this is how things are going to unfold. And that's what Paul, uh, Peter, is saying to us here. And Paul would often say, God knows. And by the foreknowledge of God the Father, this is, you are elect because of him. He chose you. You did not choose him. Remember that. And then you, you learn, and we're going to see it often in our text. You know, Peter writes about the Trinity, you know, uh, he speaks of the work of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. And so his work, God's work, is being accomplished. How? By the work of the Holy Spirit. There's this sanctification that needs to take place, this cleansing. You know, another one of those fancy words that may not make sense. That there's an inward cleansing that needs to take place. That renewal of your mind where those habits that you once, uh, you know, practiced and now they need to be changed. And you thought that they were okay, and then you learned, well, I guess I can't uh, just be a habitual liar. That's not good, you know, and say, well, I want to learn how to speak the truth. And if I can't speak the truth, then I'll say nothing, right? And, and, and that habit has changed, and the work of the Spirit as it sanctifies, as He sanctifies you, and He cleanses you and renews your thinking. Notice that it was by the foreknowledge of God in sanctification of the Spirit, and then for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And then you just think back to Exodus 24 when Moses was given the law and he would say, and he would tell them of the law and the statutes and they said, yes, we believe. Yes, we will obey. And then he took the blood and he sprinkled it on them. Imagine if you were sitting in the front row that day and, and as the blood hit you, you were saying, yes, I agree. You are God you have the standard, you know what's right, I'm ready to learn right from wrong, to submit to you, I'm ready to obey you, and I'm ready to commit to this covenant, and I'm going to be cleansed by the sanctifying work of this covenant and the sprinkling of the blood. And in the same way, in the new covenant, we have been sprinkled by the blood of Jesus Christ. And it has a sanctifying work and cleansing and clothing work in our lives, as we're clothed now in his righteousness. This is his work. He chose you. Remember that. We have a living hope, and we're going to see that specifically today. But again, the Trinity, the work of God the Father, God the Spirit, God the Son. You know, Peter learned this from Jesus. It was Jesus who really gave evidence of and spoke uh, clearly to this mystery, H how God works in heaven in that dimension and then here on this earth as Jesus came to do the will of the Father and then said, as I go, I'm going to send you a helper and I must go so that I can send you the helper. But boy, we need the cleansing work of Jesus's blood, don't we? so that we can understand. By faith, we understand. We can understand the work of God and the things that he wants to accomplish. Without uh, the, the, the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. And, and that's where it all begins. You start with that understanding, and we'll take communion today. And we take it often so that we don't forget that this is necessary. This really seals that, that initial step of faith as you hear the gospel and it produces faith in you to submit. Yes, I can, but you can. And that's what the blood of Jesus Christ does. Without his blood, there's no mercy, no forgiveness. The redemptive work of God to reconcile the world is incomplete. There needed to be that blood sacrifice. But Jesus became that sacrifice for us. Notice as he says, I'm an apostle of Jesus. I'm a missionary. I'm a sent one. I am sent out by. I was raised up in Christ and I'm here to represent. He doesn't get away from the gospel. You know, the great high priest. Yes, God the son. Notice 
because he refers here even now, in the beginnings, he tells you, reminds you, Jesus' blood was shed for you. You want to know the shepherd? The shepherd loves the sheep. The shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That's how you know the shepherd. He gives his life. He's not a hireling. He's not in it for what's best for him. He's there to give his life for you on your behalf. Notice that that's how he introduces us to Jesus. He reminds us of the fact that he had to shed his blood so that we could be sprinkled, we could be cleansed. And that's exactly what we do when we take communion as we remember the grace of God. As he says there, even grace to you and peace be multiplied. Amen to that. We need more of God's grace and peace in multiplication as you go out and you carry in you that mystery, Christ, the hope of glory, the grace, the grace of God goes with you. You're now a minister of the reconciliation and it's being multiplied. It's being, it's working in you and it doesn't stop with you. You're a conduit now. You're a vessel. You're, you're a, you too become a sent one. And the grace of God, the peace of God is being multiplied in you, working on your behalf, but also on those around you. And I know some of you are thinking, man, the person next to me needs a little more grace, you know, a little more peace. Well, that's, a, that's a, again, pray for it. That's the work of God. It's multiplied. And you notice how as you minister peace in the home, what happens? Think about the fruit of that. And in the same way as you go out, we are ministers of that covenant in Jesus. It's a reminder to us from Peter. We need to be passionate about the grace of God, not just for ourselves, but if you understand it for yourself, well, it will affect how you treat others. It should. That mercy, right? You didn't deserve it. Yet God loved you. Yet, yes, he, his grace was, has been given to you. Grace appeared, bringing salvation to all. Jesus in the flesh, embodying for us completely, perfectly the grace of God. But also the peace that we need from God. The peace that we need with God. You know, for, for many of us, there's that, um, you know, guilt and that, you know, that, condemnation that we feel right as your conscience is defiled again in christ you know that there's no condemnation for those who are in christ you you have peace with god now in jesus christ past present and future and and as you are continually professing your faith in him and you're confessing your faults before him the peace of, of god then begins to work it's not just that you have peace with God for sure, but man, you need to have that conscience purified from time to time. And again, that's, a, that's the work of the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And you think how powerful these words are. They're not just, hey, this is just a, you know, a salutation or whatever. Hey, this is Peter, I'm reaching out to you. No, no, there's so much in here that he's writing and he wants that the, the recipients, the believers, the elect to know and to re be reminded of, of, their, of their hope that they have, of the work of God and the work he's continually doing. It's neat in this way too, as you think of some of these practices, by way of tradition, we hold on to great, profound, and theological truths. Maybe traditional but man, there's some great theology in there. We've been talking about uh, the importance of good biblical traditions even today in our home group. So we're talking about some traditions that maybe are not so biblical and then some that are just profound and they're just theological at their core. And we go, ah, that's why we do that. So that you don't forget. So we take the bread and we drink the cup. Oh, so that you don't forget. Oh, that's a profound theological truth in a simple practice then these traditions are important and necessary. All right, then we get into this main text for this morning, beginning or continuing on now in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance 
incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now that's a mouthful, isn't it? You're like, okay, what is he saying there? I mean, Peter did not want to skip a heartbeat. He wanted you to have it all. We go back and you look at that. Again, I'm going to try. We'll see if we can get to verse 12. But let me just stop there for a minute. Those few verses. Notice the work of that triune work of God in a, in a kind of a triune way. Past, present, future. You see... He talks about the work of God the Father. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his abundant mercy, God's mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope. Did you know that we have a living hope? Well, I just want to remind you. I don't know. Maybe you forgot. Today, it's an encouragement. It's a reminder. We have a living hope. And we certainly live in a world that is without hope you know there's a lot of chaos and 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 there's a lot of confusion but we have a fixed steadfast living hope notice we've been born again to this living hope through the resurrection of jesus christ from the dead and that hope is notice as he says it's an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away that's good news That is a great investment. You're wondering, man, I don't know. I'm trying to think of how I can invest. Well, let me tell you. There is a hope that does not disappoint. Past, present, future. The evidence in a Christian's life uh, for salvation certainly has an element of the past. Salvation, or to be saved, as we may refer to it. What does it mean to be saved? When I talk about it, you know, what do you mean I'm being saved? I, I feel totally fine. I'm not being rescued, you know. But if you see that picture, that image, you understand you're drowning. You know, there's no, and you someone throws you one of those rescue uh, life rings. What are they called again? Thank, life preserver. Thank you. You know, and you get one of those. You mean you feel like your life's being saved? And we refer to this salvation as a free gift from God. In Ephesians 2.8, we know that we are saved by grace through faith, that it was not of us, but it was what? By the grace of God. It was a gift from God. It was Him. He gave us this gift. Jesus said in John 15 to His disciples, as I've said often this morning, He said, listen, you did not choose me, I chose you. That's what you have to understand about salvation, being saved past. It was God's work. He knows the end from the beginning. He is the initiator, but he's not just the author. He's the finisher. He's going to finish the good work. Isn't that encouraging? The good work that he began in you, he's going to complete it. So wherever you are in that journey, he's going to complete it. So you just got to stop looking to yourself and looking to your own strings. You got to start focusing once again, as you did in that day, As you receive Christ, so walk in him. You're reminded, man, I've got to go back to those basic principles, those basic truths. As I received Christ, walk in him. He says, you have been born again. It's okay to have a childlike faith, isn't it? It's okay. Look, it is those who will inherit, receive the kingdom of God. It's those who believe in such things. You know, you say, well, how do I understand? I do it by faith. What? You know? Yeah, faith. It's working in me to follow and trust in what God has foreordained. I've been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead while we were sinners. Christ died for us. Man. Praise God. On the cross, Jesus cried out, it is finished. Past tense. Right? Notice that. The work of salvation, past. It is finished. What? Like, I'm still in progress here, Lord. He's like, yeah, it's finished. It's done. So, that's a living hope. You have that hope for salvation. The work of salvation in the past. But, also in the present 
We have been saved and are being saved and one day we'll ultimately be saved. It was like, what? Try to wrap your head around that one. Past, present, future. You have been saved, you're being saved, and one day you will ultimately be saved. So if the past work is true, if you truly have experienced salvation, past tense, okay? You can relate with what Jesus says, it's finished on the cross. Yes and amen, that's me. He died for me on the cross. If that's you, well, then there's evidence of his present work. That's the way that this works. If you have that present work in you, you're a work in progress for sure. It's not that you're complete and perfect, as many of us hope. You are a work in progress. Another fancy word that's used is sanctification, as I talked about, right? What does that mean? For many, it's a foreign term because it hasn't been talked about as much in the church. Well, we're being sanctified. Paul talks about this using three different words. He talks about the, the, that instantaneous, that kind of moment where he says, you are then justified. You, you know, justification. That's salvation past tense. And you receive it, it's done. It's a done deal. You're justified before him. Just if I'd Never sinned. Oh, you sinned. But just if you had not, almost. It's, it's been covered. It's been done away with. You're forgiven. But then there's the, the, the next step. Sanctification. Now you're in this whole journey and, and, and you're being renewed in your mind as the word of God is cleansing your thinking and it's changing, you know, your, your thought life and then therefore hopefully your behaviors, Right? You know, and so as a man thinketh, so is he. And so, you, you know, you think about how the, the thoughts begin to be renewed and now your behaviors change, your habits change, and now you're doing things differently. That's the work of sanctification. That's the sanctification of the Spirit of God as he works in teaching us and, and, and renewing us through the Word of God as we're cleansed by him. And then one day, here's the other word, ultimately, glorification. Justification, sanctification, the ultimate glorification. And in the same way you could say, it's the idea of being saved, saved, being saved, and one day being saved. That's what it means. One day we're going to be ultimately glorified with him. As he is, we'll be joint heirs with Christ. That's what these, you know, these are deep theological truths. And you go, man, I didn't know what I was going to get when I showed up on Sunday morning. You know, this is what, this is what they understood. This was all now coming into, you know, their, uh, it was becoming very tangible for them. Jesus had fulfilled all these truths they were trying to wrap their head around for the centuries. We're going to see that. They were looking into this stuff for a long, 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 long time. And now it's being fulfilled in Jesus Christ perfectly. It's done. That's the new covenant. So think about it this way. In verse 4, you've been born again unto a living hope. Born again. How can I enter into my mother's room? No, you're born internally. He does a work in you. You start over. It's a work of the Spirit. You can't see the Spirit, but you can see when the Spirit is moving. As Jesus would say, like the wind. You don't see the wind, but you know when the wind hits the tree. That's how it is. You know if the Spirit of God is at work in you. But you've been born again into an inheritance future reserved in heaven for you, for me. And we're kept present by the power of God through faith. Notice, how are we kept? Faith. Ooh. Yep. That's where the rubber meets the road. You have to walk in faith. I walk by faith and not by sight. Listen, that whole work of God is a work of faith us being, uh, you know, following him in faith. We're having to continually evaluate where are we at? Am I trusting you? Am I just saying it or do I trust you truly? And this is how we can evaluate ourselves. And maybe some of you are here today and you feel like, you know what? I am close, but I'm not there yet. You alone know that. You'll know if you have that confidence, if you have that work of God in your life in the present. You, you will know that. 
If you're unsure, come, let's talk about it. Let's pray together. You can be sure. You can leave here and have that assurance of your salvation and begin to trust in the work of the Spirit and no longer, perhaps, no longer in yourself and the things that you can do and you can accomplish. That is the living hope that we have. It goes on and on and on through the centuries. It's not about how great we, the 21st century church, are going to accomplish things. Absolutely not. Probably on the contrary. How weakened we have become. How much we actually don't trust in God. We might compare ourselves to other churches and go, man, I wish we had the same faith that they had. Right? But you can't. But we have to stop trusting in ourselves. And, and that's what's happened. We've taken God out of the scene. Oh, we don't really need him now. Later. No. No, no, no. That's not a living hope. It's not just for the future. It's for the present. Amen? We need God working in us today. Even in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul would go on and say, listen, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But... It is the power of God to those who are being saved. The gospel is working in the present and it's continually working and it's going to continue to work until we are caught up with him, until he's done, until we leave our earthly dwelling. He's going to continue that work. It's the power of God, the cross. It's continually working in us. Now this is God's great work. Remember that. You see the chronology there too a little bit. As he says, it was God who foreknew by his foreknowledge and then as he accomplishes it through the work of his son Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. You see that? that you see the chronology? That this is how it all takes place. And it was, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but the, the prophets looked ahead to that time. They were like, oh, how is this you know, going to take place and when? They, 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 they were given these truths, but they, but they just didn't know when. And you and I look back. So this is an awesome encouragement for us to take home today with us. In the midst of everything that's going on, you think about uh, your provision. You think about uh, your, your sustenance even today and how, you know, what God has for you today. Remember that there is for you and for me an inheritance reserved amen it's got your name on it you know a lot you have a locker and a key and it's there for you it's not no one's going to get a hold that's for you it's sealed it's set up there and guess what it's incorruptible as we were praying this morning uh before coming into service it's incorruptible guess what no thief can break in and steal it you know the salty air is not going to rust it you know and you just think about it's an incorruptible not fading reserved inheritance for you for me that's what this living hope is it's salvation but it is to be experienced today and this is where i think sometimes we make the mistake as we just think of it in those terms ah it's up there okay i'll get it later Oh, we walk in it as a reality today. Friends, this is not our home. As much as I know often you may shop at, I don't know, Michael's and Hobby Lobby and Ross and you decorate and you make cozy your home and, and, and it, all of that's wonderful. Just remember, this is not your home. You know, and one day somebody else is going to enjoy the beautiful things that you've decorated and you put in place, or they're just going to throw them out, whatever it may be. You know, it's a, it's a short-lived temporal thing, isn't it? And I love making, you know, having a cozy and stylish and comfortable place to dwell, for sure. That's all fine, as long as we still keep in mind and we understand that it's temporal. You, listen, we are pilgrims. We are sojourners. You know, in a foreign land. It seems kind of strange, but we are, right? And in and, and that way, we are. We are to be pilgrims here. Now, it would be unfair not to address the men, right? 
I know about that shiny toolbox and the garage and, and all the toys and all the things that you've worked so hard to, to get hold of. And, and remember, that's okay as long as you don't forget about and you're careful that those things don't grip hold of you that cause you to let, you know, to uh, forget laying hold to those things that you are to be gripping tight of your inheritance in heaven. These things certainly will, will pull at us, won't they? You know, say, well, I want to go to heaven. Yeah, I can't wait, but just not now. You know, and then when everything's falling apart, it's like, Lord, come right now, you know. And, 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 and then that tension, there has to be that balance of continually, uh, you know, reevaluating, making sure that our treasures are in heaven. Amen. Then Jesus say, listen, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And that's the danger, is that your heart now, your affections begin to grow for these things. And then guess what? You can't share your affections in your heart, at, you know, as much as you think equally and fairly, you know, is the way you think that you can. And you've got all these things in your life, and then you leave a little bit left over for, for your Savior, for your heavenly hope. And there's just a little bit in there. Oh, yeah. And you think that it's just you who sees it. No, people see it. And, and we are to be, uh, you know, like the pilgrims who look. People see us and they say, man, there's something different about that person. They live differently. They plan differently. And far too often, we, the church, look much like the world. And our hope are fixed. It's fixed on the things around us. And that's not, well, can be unhealthy. And, and, and you alone have to, to, to really weigh that out. We, we have certainly live in, a, in this time of grace and we have a, this hope for eternity and we know Jesus is coming back, but you alone will know where the balance is. You know, are, are you really uh, fixing in heaven your heart, your uh, devotion, your affections? Is it really fixed in heaven? And, and you can evaluate and, and, and go before the Lord today and have those things, those thoughts renewed and in, and in that same way corrected. You know, Lord, help me. Help us. Our inheritance is there in heaven. So please don't get me wrong. I'm not anti, you know, uh, pleasures in life or making your home beautiful or having toys around. I'm not anti any of those things. That certainly, I don't think God is. But he wants to be number one in your life. He wants to have your affection. And that is simply that that's, he's a jealous God. He doesn't want to share in that way. He wants you to have fun, but he wants to be number one in your life. Amen? Now, I'm going to have to end there just because of time. But, uh, man, I'm so excited to continue. Let's, uh, let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, I thank you so much for this time that we have in your word and this time we get to have here in Florida as we gather as a body of believers in your name. Lord, we look to you. You are our hope in everything. Lord, we trust you. We want to surrender to you. We're committed to you. Lord, we believe that you are going to do a great, great work yet in these days that we're living, which seems so hopeless. Lord, our hope is real. And I pray that you just give us the boldness by the power of your Holy Spirit to go out and to be your witnesses. We ask this, Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And we're going to take communion now. So as the worship band leads us in a song, the ushers are going to pass out the elements. Just take the, 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 the cup and hold on to it, and in a few minutes we'll partake together.
what a good encouragement for us to have, but then all oh, to know that the provision is there. He's provided. He's provided for us. It's all good. And if you're unsure of that provision, uh, having forgiveness for, for your sins and, and having that same peace and that confidence before God, you can be sure today, right now, as you might take this moment. Maybe you've taken uh, you know, the cup and you're holding it in your hand now and you're thinking about uh, where you stand before the Lord. If you'll confess your sins, it says he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So I don't know where you're at, but the Lord, he sure is ready. If you're ready, he says he stands at the door and knocks. And this is what we as a church, as a family, uh, do together and we do it often. We're reminded by the provision of our Lord, the grace of our Lord through his sacrifice and the life he gives us everlasting through the resurrection. I'd like to go ahead and just read here in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He says, verse 23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So Lord... We are going to take this now in remembrance of you. But we know that without you, none of this would be possible. But you became flesh. And Lord, you bore on your body, Lord, the sins. Lord, your body was broken so that we could be made whole. And we recognize that. We remember that. And Lord, we thank you for that together. Let's take it. And then in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord, too, in that same way, as we remember the fact that you became flesh and dwelt among us, and used your fleshly body, Lord, to become that sacrifice for us. We know, too, that you offered your sinless, pure blood to wash away our sins. And Lord, as we've been encouraged and reminded today, as Moses sprinkled the blood upon the people, and we too have been sprinkled by your blood. And we want to be um, just renewed in that today. Lord, forgive us, cleanse us, wash us in your blood. Make us whole again, and, and if there's any guilt, any shame, any condemnation, we just... Look to you. And we trust in you. And we ask you to wash us clean. We thank you for it together. Let's drink in Jesus' name. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus is alive. And he's coming back again. Amen? Amen? Happy Father's Day to you all. If I don't get to see you after this, we pray that you have a blessed weekend day today with your family. And really look forward to playing some volleyball and grilling out. Sure. God bless you guys.